Today we speak to Zach Coplin, investigative journalist at the Government Accountability Project. He recently released an article at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project asking, why is the United States still fighting in Afghanistan? According to a new mini Panama paper style investigation that he and fellow journalist Margot Bin wrote at the OCCRP, it is to allow American businesses to win corrupt deals. Zach uncovered an American military contractor, SOSI, that won illegal mining rights in Afghanistan, granted directly by the country's president, Ashraf Ghani. SOS won those rights after making the president's brother a secret 20% partner in its Afghan subsidiary. American Special Operations Forces are also implicated in the scheme. This investigation took Zach and Margot two years and an incredible amount of work to get done. We spoke to him today to discuss this article. The link is in the description, and I implore every listener to read this article before you listen to this interview. This is even more important now that the United States is pulling out of Afghanistan, and most future American involvement of the country will perhaps be completed by corrupt contractors such as this. Thanks for joining today, Zach. Um, so, yeah, you know, I wanted to talk to you about the very interesting piece that you um, <laughs> that you released on the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project um, that um, I'll have the link um, below in the details for people to, uh, um, to, to go to to read, but um, it's, it's a fantastic story. Uh, uh, not really fantastic. Um, it actually, all of this is, is occurring, right? So um, uh, I've been following you on Twitter, kind of keeping up to date as best I can, but it would be great for um, listeners of this podcast to get some background on how you came about this story, um, then into the, the, the very complex web of um, all of the actors at play. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and if, and if as best you can, you know, sort of explain it like I'm five sort of situation, because there are a lot of people that just are not familiar with yeah. um, the contracting oh. world. Um, uh, American wars. And, yes, American war. Yeah, the, and the minutia, especially because, and I'd really love to talk to you probably a little bit at the end about some of the publications, um, not um, covering a lot of this, a, a lot of mm -hmm. the, uh, the details around um, American conflicts and American wars abroad, or at least conflicts and wars in which American um, taxpayer money is certainly at, uh, yeah. at play. So um, I'll, I'm happy to sit back and, and listen to you. Um, uh, and I will ask questions as, as necessary. So appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I originally heard about this story. It's probably been, um, it's been over two years. I really started looking at this in April of 2019. Um, and I had been tipped off by a former employee of a military contractor called SOS International. Um, because I've been reaching out to a lot of employees of this company about their business in Iraq, uh, where they, in Iraq, they control a major military base called Camp Taji, uh, where they controlled up until recently. And they got it through a corrupt deal with Iraq's former prime minister, Nuri al-Maliki, who, if your listeners may or may not remember, um, was for almost a decade, the leader of Iraq and was supported by the U.S. government, which- Essentially the de facto yeah, US leader of Iraq. De facto Iraq. dictator. Yes. Um, he was democratically elected sort of-ish um, and supported in his corruption and cruelties by the U.S. government. Um, but anyway, so, so I was looking at that and that actually came out in an article a couple of years back um, in the Daily Beast about their deals at this military base. Um, but when I was asking those questions, um, a couple of people kind of mentioned to me, they said, well, what about Afghanistan? Um, and they were like, you know, the nephew of the president worked for us, um, which I did not know at that time. <laughs> and that kind of perked my ears up. And it turns out the president's nephew had been an intern for two months um, at, at this company, SOS International, or SOSI as they often go by. And I started asking around um, and, trying to find some new sources to get a better understanding of what was going on. And eventually I learned that it wasn't really the president's nephew, but his brother, this guy named Hashmat Ghani, um, who was kind of, was the, was the secret partner of Sosi. Um, and they were, 
beyond just contracting, they had gotten into the uh, mining business in Afghanistan. Um, and, and it was being facilitated by the president's brother. And I've been told this. Um, and they, the indications were there that it was true. I mean, again, the nephew was an intern um, and things lined up, but it was like, how do you prove that the president's brother is, um, <laughs> is a silent partner? Because this, this, the whole point of these kind of deals is that they are meant to be disguised. Um, so for me, what I first found um, was I managed to get a hold of an old um, business directory of Kabul um, that was published in 2005. And in there, I found the company that this military contractor was using was called Southern Development. Um, and it was an Afghan company. And I found that Southern Development existed at least as far back as 2005. And in 2005, um, it was controlled by the president's brother. Um, I found a few more archival documents up through 2007 and then a confirmation from a, um, an NGO in 2008 that the president's brother was involved in this company. But then it just goes, he, di he disappears from it. Um, and his, his name was taken off at least by about 2013 um, when his brother was elected president. So it became a question of how do you, again, I, mean, I can look at that and say, I've been told the president's brother's a partner and look, he owned the company originally, but that's not enough to publish it. Sure. Um, so you're essentially getting tipped yeah. off. You're getting um, uh, sort of um, not necessarily confidential leaks, but you're, you're yeah. starting to get um, people dropping information to you. Um, so put the lay the groundwork about this story. Um, um, so take us to Afghanistan. We're in Afghanistan. This is two years ago, you said? Yeah. I'm, I was two, not in Afghanistan, but right. yes. no, yes, no, yes, yeah. we're not in Afghanistan, but this is <laughs> Afghanistan two years ago, because yeah. this, this story was just published, so we're, but we're, yeah. we're talking two years ago at the height of the Trump administration, um, uh, looking to pull out potentially, but the uh, president, uh, uh, the prime minister of Afghanistan um, is, um, uh, I'm, how would you call it? Um, dangling contracts to mining yeah. uh, uh, operations oh, yeah. to American or even Western companies yes. to allow um, resources Chinese to stay also. there. Right. Um, yeah. So there's a complex, long and complex history of, of, of contractors coming in. We, we Americans saw this after um, uh, the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Um, we, the American military forces um, flattened the country and then we go in uh, we as in the, the American contractors go in and begin to rebuild. So what, what what's what's different about this? Why does this stick out? What's the um, what's the so problem? Because this is an interesting sure. one. Um, so you have you have a lot of American interests. Um, I mean, Eric Prince, for example, um, notorious kind of he wants to be a, yeah Blackwater CEO, wannabe Lord of War, involved in really he's like two steps back from any scheme you hear about, about mercenaries or spooks or like assassinations or smuggling sure. opium or whatever you hear, everyone is talking, every, everywhere in the background, he kind of looms, was interested in Afghan minerals. Um, he, there, the CEO of DynCorp um, and this uh, billionaire, Stephen Feinberg, who served on Trump's um, presidential intelligence advisory board, which is just a, it's an appointed intelligence position. Um, and again, billionaire was interested in Afghan minerals. You've got a variety, everyone kind of, Afghanistan, for the first main export that was coming out was smuggled uh, opium. Uh, but then people realized that there might be upwards of $3 trillion of minerals. Um, we, the, there's not really a total, re, the, the estimate is somewhere between one and $3 trillion of minerals under right. the surface there. Um, realize there's a lot of money to be made and and the Afghan government realized that's a way to buy support um, desperate they, they des I mean the Afghan government is kind of holding on by the skin of his teeth right now um, and that, that that was a tool they could use and so they they attempted to use it um, to offer Americans and again Westerners and Chinese and anyone else who could give them money, troops, so anything to continue to maintain and build a government. 
Um, so that, 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 that's kind of the status quo there um, that you have this company coming in. The question though, right, is how do you actually pull that off? Because it's one thing to say there's a trillion dollars of minerals. It's another thing to say, we're gonna go mine the minerals, ex like break them up into manageable bits that we can export and then export them and sell them. You need the whole supply chain there. Meanwhile, you're dealing with the Taliban and ISIS, um, which control parts of Afghanistan. You're dealing with corrupt officials. You're dealing with um, just, and just the general struggle of mining, which is you've got to actually, like mine, mining is not necessarily a fast industry to make money in because there's a lot of initial investment. Um, so basically there, there's a lot of challenges actually implementing this. So how, how do you actually do that, right? Well, the easiest way is to make a political partnership. And that's what this military contractor did, uh, SOS International. So tell us, through, go, go through the details that you kind of laid out in order mm -hmm. in the article that um, you wrote. Um, can you explain some of the background of the company? Who's the company that was involved? Who's the subsidiary that was involved? Yeah. And how did they get into Afghanistan to even come to know yeah. the president and his family and just um, paint the regime theory, so to speak, yeah. about um, uh, everything that's centered around this. So, yeah, so what was fascinating about this um, to me was that the um, that this this had really deep roots. Um, and, and a lot of actually we've noticed um, the DynCorp, comp DynCorp and that billionaire who was associated with Trump had a similar theory according to the New York Times. Um, I don't think he actually ended up ever mining anything. But there, but there was a group, um, a small, pen, uh, it was kind of a, um, set up by David, uh, General Petraeus, um, who was the former commander in Afghanistan and Iraq, and then the CIA director who eventually got in trouble for giving his mistress classified information, um, that guy. So he kind of was involved in setting up this, what was kind of a little bit out there for the US military, an office called the Task Force for Business and um, Stability Operations. And it, it actually also employed at one point Pete, uh, former presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg, um, interestingly enough. And it was, it was a non-military office. Um, it was meant to be a bunch of business people and consultants. And they were supposed to go into these war zones and basically create jobs for the local population so that people would be less inclined to join militant groups. Um, so in Afghanistan, they were involved in a little bit of oil production. Um, they were involved in apparently goat farming for Kashmir. Um, pomegranates, <laughs> pomegranate production, and then of course the big one was mining. Um, and one of the biggest projects this group actually pulled off was they went out into uh, kind of the, to one of the provinces in Afghanistan called Kunar. And in Kunar, they were really close with some of the local special forces, the American special forces officers. And I guess there was some sort of quid pro quo. My best guess is um, in return for giving them security when they wanted, um, as fast as they wanted. They were gonna go help secure the province for the special forces, um, which the special forces meant ensuring the loyalty of local warlords um, and buying off those warlords. So there, there were these two guys we know, one was named Noor Muhammad and another was named Farhad. Um, and they're likely from one of the, one of the local tribes um, and they ran, they were the local commanders, what was called the Afghan, they were part of the Afghan local police, which was a government aligned militia. And they had been collecting chromite, which is a mineral used in stainless steel and airplane paint and a variety of industrial applications. And they, had, they just had a bunch of it and didn't know what to do with it. They were selling it. They were smuggling it into Pakistan at the time. <laughs> um, and so the American Special Forces said, hey, these are our buddies. You would be really great is if you could help them with their chromite business. Um, so the US, the Pentagon Business Development Office made, made them a company. It got them uh, about $3.8 million was what uh, Rand um, Corp estimated uh, in chromite crushing equipment and the tools needed to kind of process this ore that these local warlords had. And then it brought it to a, a military outpost for NATO in, in Kunar and they started helping these warlords process their minerals. Um, presumably it was then sold on through Pakistan. There's talk of like a, it was going to a Swedish company. Um, and so this, and this is all essentially run by the US government. 
Unfortunately, this was illegal in two ways in, under Afghan law and probably illegal as mineral looting under international law. So the first problem is that Afghan law bars official local officials, um, which these warlords counted as, um, from owning mineral rights. You can't be a government official and have mineral rights, um, e even in a proxy capacity like a government-aligned warlord. So that's one uh, that was illegal. And then they were buying from local mines, which were unregulated by the government. They weren't paying taxes. They were potentially, some of them were for sure controlled by the Taliban. I saw a post on Twitter about one of these mines after my article from a for former special forces guy who explained that it had been mined by the Taliban by shooting um, artillery at the rocks, which uh, is really That's not one great. way to do it. Yeah, but the problem also chromites <laughs> are carcin a carcinogen. Right. And when you shoot artillery at it, you're going to aerosolize it, meaning that you're going to give all the local population cancer. Sure. Which brings me to the next point about why this is illegal, because it doesn't follow health and safety rules. <laughs> um, it can harm the environment, harm the workers, harm everyone living around it. So this was 100% illegal and was facilitated by the U.S. government. It got shut down when a local um, NGO called Integrity Watch Afghanistan, finds out about it and publishes a report. So this was a watchdog group. And now what year is this at this point? This, so the mining started, the, the operation started in 2011. Then in 2013, it all gets shut down. Right. Um, so they basically catch wind of this yeah. through a watchdog group. And the entire project gets shut down, which basically sends the signal uh, you know, none of, none of these mining operations can occur again until mm -hmm. there are either updates on Afghanistan regulation or law, or that it's agreed upon and it's sanctioned by, um, uh, you know, all, all of the process and normal, normal processes that have to be put in place yes. before you start uh, mining. So, so at this point, 2013, there's no mining happening in Afghanistan by third party. Um, yeah. um, Artisanal is what they call it. Okay. Um, you can have you can have big mines. There's a few, but there's not much happening anyway because, again, it's really hard when there's a war going on um, right. or a multi-party civil war. Essentially, um, the Chinese, for example, control um, some large mines that have never really been used. Um, and there, there's, but most most of the mining in Afghanistan right now, it's largely illegal mining done by militant groups or done by locals, often who have to pay off militant groups. Sure. So anyway, so yeah, so. So the status quo is that this is illegal, but the people who were involved in this, I, I would say are both ideological devotees um, and wanted to make some money. Um, they, they truly did believe, I think, that facilitating local mining was good for the United States. Again, the idea is you create jobs, you facilitate business, and there's less reason to have a war. Um, and Again, sounds great in theory. In reality, it's a little bit more complex than just make jobs. You have to. There, there's a bigger picture here, <laughs> um, but but they but they believe that that's what they're going to do. Uh, some special forces guys and some of this former task force. So you get um, what's interesting is you get the special forces guy who appears like he was out involved in this process. Who then he writes a master's thesis actually, where he's interviewing all the former task force employees about basically how great the project was and how the Afghan government was wrong to shut them down and how they really need to do this more. The special forces really need to be involved in mining Afghanistan. And you know what? Next time, you just need to get the key leaders on board. <laughs> um, that was kind of the theory so of the case So who here. is he writing this thesis to? I guess he was in military his, academics. Yeah. He and was in the Naval Postgraduate School. I see. Okay. And so he's, yeah. he's basically writing, you know, uh, for American interests, essentially yeah. explain, essentially saying, how to pull this hey, th these used to be the good old days. Yeah. Um, when when this mining op when these mining operations were um, uh, uh, susceptible to um, American interests, we should go yeah. back to this yes. um, and and delivers this master's thesis um, to the Naval War College. Yeah, and basically says we should expand this to all of Afghanistan. This should be our model for special forces work in the future. Um, and then his, his other former colleagues kind of decide again. I, it doesn't seem like this is uh, who I mean. Look, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I actually tried very hard to figure out if this was kind of an official U.S. government thing with this contractor, because there's a lot of talk about uh, special forces and intelligence interests with with these groups, and then the contractor being a front for the Department of Defense. That on the Afghan side, this contractor is viewed as a front for the U.S. government, and right. 
and they're well connected. They they provided um, David Petraeus as translator initially and close confidant, this guy, Saudi Othman. And then they um, they also hired after he left the military, um, former three-star general Frank Helmick, who was Petraeus' top deputy in Iraq. Um, so they're, they're well connected in that office. The task force was originally Petraeus Brain Trust. And then he, again, he was a top commander, wanted to be the CIA director. Um, so there, there's a lot of there's a lot of weird things. And then also interestingly, this task force, I heard anecdotes. Um, it was at least viewed, it's unclear if it was an intelligence asset or just viewed this way by um, special forces operators. Sometimes when these contractors show yeah. up in places like Afghanistan and, and just, just many of the, many of these countries, they they become yeah. inadvertent. Yes. Uh, 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 yeah. yeah. Assets so anyway, in, in this way, but yes, it's it's, it's hard to exactly know what's going on. Um, sure. I can say for sure, special forces. I, I talked to someone in the former task force who said, "Well, look, I was an intelligence. As far as I'm aware, we weren't intelligence, but special forces, at least, why I mean, this this person talked about having discussions with special forces, where special forces insisted to them that they were intelligence, <laughs> um, which they thought was very interesting. So. There's a lot of there's a lot of questions about who who exactly was involved in this originally, who where they fit in the U.S. military and intelligence apparatus. I I can't exactly answer it for you, except that it's all very weird. But anyway, they all end up. What I can tell you is, post this project being shut down, the people involved with it never gave up, and they realigned in the private sector as part of a, a consultancy called. Global Ventures, which was led by the former natural um, director of natural resources for this task force. Um, her name is Emily Scott King, and then her husband Mark, who was a, well, I was told he was a special forces reservist in Afghanistan, serving as uh, contract security for the task force. Um, they were actually living on a special forces base at the time, kind of inappropriately, allegedly, with an arsenal of unlicensed um, weapons. So anyway. let me get this straight. So the director of this task force, uh, who was banned from mining or even discussing or, or planning mining operations, was was, also, I wish she would say she wasn't banned from discussing, but she. Their well, they ended the project. The project, the project, for the project was shut down. She yeah. was married to a private security uh, uh, personnel, private security contractor for that group. So yes. this group was disbanded. Now she swings back around into Afghanistan through, oh, through private, right, private sector through this company. And yeah, please continue. So yeah, so she, she makes this company. And at some point, the, the company is hired by SOS International. And what's this company called? Uh, their consultancy was called Global Venture. Okay. Um, and then they're hired by the military contractor, SOS International, which is, again, all these groups have all these, they, someone knew someone from back in their military days. Um, and somehow, again, we, we don't know the inner workings of exactly how this all coalesced, except that before long, she was a consultant there and brought with her the original plans for this Kunar chromite crusher, crushing project. And SOSI began investing in the chromite business in Afghanistan, um, starting around roughly 2015, um, two years after that was shut down. And that some somewhere in that period um, is when Sosi got involved with the president's brother. The the best timing I can give you. Uh, let me get the exact date. Um, it's in my article because we have we have um, we know the exact date that a uh, company was created between Sosi and the president's brother. So, what, so where, yeah, because I'm, I'm very curious how Sosi actually wound up in Afghanistan and what they're originally yeah. seeking to do, because they're not primarily a mining company, correct? Yeah. No, they've, as far as I'm aware, they've never mined before. But on June 17th, 2014, um, at, there was a partnership. We know, we know at least by then there was a partnership between Sosi and the president's brother. Um, so sometimes which, which is normally not, that's normally not... I, I mean, it's always a big deal, right? When we're dealing yeah. with how these, but uh, and a lot of these contracts um, are kind of carried out this way. But th but this one in particular seems uh, nefarious and, yes. um, for lack of a better word, um, just um, wildly corrupt. Yeah, and, and the reason also we know that th this partnership took place on that day, and this this is, I know I, I was kind of. Well, I'll jump around, I guess, in terms of telling how we got the story in pieces now. But um, 
this is this one's a huge point of pride for me actually. So we managed to pull a document uh, from Ras al Khaimah, which is in the United Arab Emirates. It's a um, it's the Ras al Khaimah Free Zone, um, which for your listeners who know what the Panama Papers is, it's a secrecy jurisdiction. Um, it doesn't disclose ownership publicly. Um, the, the entire benefit of this place is that no one knows who owns your company. Um, and it's pretty secure, but ultimately was not secure enough. And we got a hold of this document that shows that the military contractor, SOS International, owned 80% of the company with the president's brother owning the remaining 20%. Um, and we published that document. Um, and those and documents was, are held on your Twitter account. Yes, um, and in so, the article. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, that will be, so yeah, if anyone is interested in, in looking at some of that backup data, it is there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, I tend to publish uh, everything. Yeah. everything that we can for without endangering sources. Sure. Um, but yeah, this and this took place, this document was signed or created three days after Hashmat Ghani's brother, Ashraf Ghani, became president of Afghanistan. Um, so that's also very weird. Again, why do they need the secret document three days after his brother was elected? Um, so, so anyway, but putting, placing it in time, they've got the partnership then. At that point, they're talking about mining chromite. It doesn't appear that ever successfully happened, largely because that's just really hard to do if you're a big Western company. You, like, it's just it's not easy to mine for all the reasons we laid out earlier. Um, so at some point, the plan switches again to buying locally mined artisanal chromite, which again, artisanal is just for your listeners who don't know what that means. Is again, it's mined by hand, mined by the locals, not mined under contract. Um, so they're mining, they're buying artisanal chromite is the new plan and they're building a chromite processing factory, which gets built in 27, 2018, um, 2017, 2018. We see trade records in 2018 showing SOCI importing, um, chromite crushing equipment from, um, South Africa. So it's, it's taken another few years, again, mining and mining processing, like kind of businesses. They're a slow initial investment before you start making money. So this, this is kind of, this is not surprising that it's taken them a few years to kind of get it going. Um, but then in 2019, um, my colleague Margot, who published this piece with me, um, and also just tons of credit to her. Um, her name is Margot Ben, and she writes a lot for Le Figaro in France. Um, got a hold of a bunch of documents from the Afghan government that showed that what was called um, the high economic council, I want to say, um, let me make sure I'm just right on that. Um, yeah, high economic council in the yeah. Afghan government, which is directly overseen by the Afghan president, uh, Hani himself. Um, he, they signed off on special extra legal rights to, um, to this comp to SOCI um, in the mining process or to SOCI subsidiary Southern Development, which is one the brother partially owns. So they signed off on special rights to buy chromite artist from artisanal mines in six provinces in Afghanistan, uh, Kunar and five other ones, um, Khost, Paktia, Paktika, Ghazni, and Maidan Warda. And also to purchase 20,000 tons of chromite that were already under control of the Afghan government and had been mined by locals. Presumably the Afghan government had maybe confiscated this. Um, and this process was, First off, local news suggests that the process to award these um, these special rights was overseen directly by the president. And then our source is also, um, it's apparently well known that the Afghan president micromanages contracts. So it's highly unlikely he did not know what was happening here. Um, and again, these rights are not legal under Afghan mineral law. Um, it's just that the president kind of has went around the law and granted them Essentially, it's, it's extra legal. Um, saying, yeah, the law says no one can mine these minerals, but they're mining them, so you can go buy them. Um, and again, you can argue that would be against government interests because they might be buying from the Taliban. Um, we, we don't really know who they're buying from. Uh, or and it, Maybe they don't even know who they're buying from um, because supply chains are going to be hard to track in this kind of... In, in a country like Afghanistan, in the regions they're buying from. Right. Um, so what would you say are like the broad conclusions from the story um, that we, that, that, you know, that we, well, yeah. What are the broad conclusions that we can draw 
from you know everything that's happened with Sosi, this um, a seemingly seemingly illegal and corrupt uh, mining deal. Um, what what eventually happened? I mean, so this is this is kind of going to the broader point about American wars, which is that for the most part, wars are a sham. And I'm going to draw on some of my experience in Iraq also for the, just to kind of talk about this. Again, the minerals could be bought from people. This is let's talk. This is a U.S. military contractor. Again, connected in the intelligence and the Pentagon apparatus, um, with literally employing high-ranking generals or retired generals. It is buying minerals that are almost certainly sourced from militant groups that Americans have fought and died fighting. I mean, that that's. But the thing is, this is not uncommon. I know stories, I, 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 know, I, I know about companies in Iraq, which w- just would straight up, th- so the US military needs guns, they need Humvees, they need water, they need food, right? And a lot of this stuff is not produced in Iraq. So it's shipped in either over the border through Jordan, or south through the only uh, port that Iraq has in Qasr, or trucked in from Turkey. Like, um, and and so the problem is it's running through the territory of people that the U.S. government is fighting. Um, in, in the South, running it would often run through the territory of what was called Jaysh al Mahdi, um, which has now been a while since they've been a major factor. Um, it was run by a kind of a, a charismatic nationalist uh, preacher, uh, Muqtada al Sadr, um, and for. The first five or so years after the initial American invasion of Iraq, they were one of the most deadly opponents of the U.S. government. Um, And so the shipping companies the U.S. used to supply the U.S. military in Iraq all had to pass through Jaysh al-Mahdi's territory. Uh, And all their trucks were getting blown up. So (laughs) what they decided to do was then hire people associated with the local Jaysh al-Mahdi commanders to transport American Humvees to American bases. And so what would happen is every truck that you paid Jay Shalmati for went to the American base and didn't get blown up. It might get blown up the next day by Jay Shalmati, who then had created a market for the supply of another Humvee. Um, So what you essentially essentially have is, rather than looking at this as an actual war, is (laughs) this is large scale cartel operations um, where, the U.S. government is essentially paying the people it's fighting in a way that creates demand for continued violence. <laughs> um, and then you wonder why wars aren't ending. And, and I know the, the example I just gave about Jay Shalmati there, the, the local militia commander has retired. He, I've heard, lives in Dubai now. And his buddies were with the Americans who were doing the logistics supply. So... <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah. the, it just, it's just that this entire thing is a scam um, because... <laughs> it just certainly creates an engine for, yeah. for especially for when, you know, yes, and, and, and but also this sort of seemingly endless cycle of budget, you know, to yeah. come from uh, um, the Department of Defense budget and, uh, yeah. and, and fueling a lot of the, the local supply yeah. chains that, that, that's required. If that, uh, you know, if, if, if machinery or equipment or arms uh, goes... Uh, um, used, they, they need new new items to continue yeah. operations, right? Yeah. And it also, I think the point is, because we hear there's been a ton of news coverage about the ideological reasons behind things. I mean, again, like, I mean, ISIS is horrific. Um, and, and I haven't worked on ISIS specifically, but you see very similar things happening with like Iranian back militias, where it's like, you, the, I mean, they're committing sectarian, the, the grunts are committing sectarian atrocities. But the, the commander level, for the most part, is, is aligned in the Iraqi business world. They're connected to the American contractors and the leadership of both the contractors, who are all, again, the retired generals from the U.S. government, from the Pentagon, and then the commanders of their enemies are all getting rich um, and are all dealing with each other. And, and I mean, again, what was explained to me, for example, about the former prime minister, um, Again, jumping back to what I mentioned in the very beginning about the um, Sosi in Iraq paying off the former prime minister, Nuri al-Maliki, it was done through an organization that was called AFAQ. Um, And 
basically the most interesting thing I had told because I, I, I kind of, I had ascribed Afak to be kind of Iranian backed uh, Shia aligned uh, uh, company. And someone said, well, look, they are, but to understand this, and you have to understand this company can be Shia if it's needed, and that's who they're dealing with. It can be Sunni if it needs to present a Sunni face. It can be Kurdish if it needs to present a Kurdish face. The, the point's not the sectarian identity. They'll do business with anyone and can be whoever's needed to be to make money. Right. Um, whether they're dealing with militias, whether they're dealing with Americans, whether they're dealing with business leaders. And that, that really, again, it really just punches a hole in the narrative you hear about, again, endless sectarian war, that this is, this is a conflict that's gone on forever, that it can't be healed. Like, no, this is about money. It's been about money and money's made it far worse. And it's just been couched in sectarianism. Sure. I did see on your Twitter that someone from, was it Sosi actually reached out or they didn't reach out, but they, they posted the article in question and said um, that, you know, they basically said, this is hearsay. They slandered me. And I believe you replied that you had reached out to them and they had not responded. So, uh, Sosi, I don't believe has responded to us. They've in the past, maybe so in the in the past, they've accused me of being a terrible journalist. That was about the Iraq article. They sent me some nasty letters threatening to sue me. Um, this time they just they didn't respond. Um, now Hashmat Ghani, the um, so both the Afghan government and Hashmat Ghani, the president's brother, have responded to us. What did the um, Afghan government tell you in response to this? So um, the Afghan government responded after the piece and they said they have no contract with Hashmat Ghani, which is kind of not the point. We say he's a part owner of a company that has rights. Um, sure. So it doesn't really answer the piece. And that, that's right. all I've said. That's all, that's, it's not true and was done without sufficient research. Um, Yanni, of course, had a very funny answer to us. Um, so again, the allegation, the prime allegation in this article is that he is a secret owner of a company that's received special um, rights to buy minerals. I, I don't know if he didn't read our article or wasn't paying enough attention but he essentially, in his response, he, again, he denied all, all corruption um, with his companies, including his company that's processing chromite. Now, the problem is the central allegation in the article is that he owned, he was a part owner of this factory, secret part owner, by saying that his company, that like his, his chromite company that's been accused in this article of corruption is not corrupt. He just acknowledged owning the chromite company which is kind of the central thrust of our article. So it was, it was quite funny to see that. Um, although he, he did not respond to us at the time and did not respond to any of my follow-up questions after the article, after he tweeted that. Not, not, not surprising, but yeah, no. okay. Now you did try to, uh, is it true that you tried to um, publish this elsewhere? Or can, yes. you, can you talk a little bit about um, how you were, uh, or what the response was from major media outlets when you went with this story to them? Was it not juicy enough? What, what was missing? What were the, some of the things that they that they uh, uh, explained to you as why they would not run with it or publish it so in major media in American markets? Not to be not to be hyper. Um, this this is this is a, in kind of a I would say a media insider conversation in part. Um, it's a, it's sure. a mix of two things. You so don't have to name first, any names unless you want. Oh to. no, I, I won't. Um, <laughs> but this this is more. So basically, there is um, there's one half of this conversation, which is American media does not care about the rest of the world and does not care. Sure. There, there's a lot of there's an appearance that media loves these story, juicy stories about corruption, exposing wrongdoing, and large investigations. Right. That is that that's an appearance that everyone loves to give. When it comes down to it, first off, this is a lot of work. Um, even and so for me and Margo, it was a lot of work. For our editors, it was less work. It was still a lot of work. They had to understand everything. They had to go through. I mean, we spent weeks in fact checking. Um, I mean, going through literally. I, I have a version of this with hundreds of citations. Um, going. I mean, and I'm, I also would love to explain later just kind of the process for one of my favorite things. But like literally matching up phone numbers, and I, I, I have half page long citations explaining who owns a phone number, how we know they own the phone number, what the phone number is associated with and what that means. And going through that with my editors, going through, I mean, we had total, we had seven people work on this article. So again, and, and there's legal liability risks. There's the hours put in. There's the fact that people aren't necessarily gonna read this. So it's a lot of work for not necessarily, so 
for potentially negative financial return for the news organization itself. Right. So that's, that's one problem here. Um, then there's the cynicism. A lot of editors don't necessarily care about Afghanistan and right. don't think their audience does either. Um, and isn't necessarily willing to do the work or promote this. And then there's just the fact, and this, and this is the, free, the insider thing. I am not employed by a news organization. I'm employed by a nonprofit where I do investigative work um, called the Government Accountability Project. And there's a lot of just pettiness about how I'm not necessarily famous enough to do this work, or I'm, I'm just not a big enough name, or they just don't feel like dealing with me. Now, there was me. pettiness on behalf of, of news media organizations news media. and pri private, specifically, specifically private ones that um, yes, were, this were, is, this were, is rejecting, were rejecting you based on the, that criteria? Yes. Um, so, the, I mean, so... Yeah, so I got some answers like that, um, some answers um, before, uh, some answers about how, for example, Afghanistan, my, this work on Afghanistan just was not vital, um, was what I was told by one organization. Um, and, and then there's some specifically about how essentially they didn't want my byline on it, um, which, is, which is, again, I, I, I don't want to get into too much for, 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 for about the story, too much kind of intermediate squabbles but people can be nasty um right. and then a lot of people just straight up didn't answer me i guess because they don't care about corruption in afghanistan even if it implicates the president um so anyway but i i ultimately i had a running list that reached about 40 different news organizations that i tried to get to take this before i kind of stopped keeping track um and then i managed to get occrp on board which solve that problem thank you yeah. it just was a brutal process it basically this put it this way i'm very grateful occrp took it it worked out perfectly um they were they were a great place um to again they put in a lot of their own effort and energy into this um to make it as good as it could be but it wasn't like another news organization couldn't have had this scoop <laughs> um, right i was offering it around and no one else was interested it's a fascinating story, um, and I and I urge um, anybody listening to go again. That link will be in the description and in the de details, uh, and you lay it out um, very well. And you, you can tell that uh, you and the other journalists did a lot of work on this. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of great work. I was um, I've been covering or at least following a lot of these um, similar stories in the contracting world, and this one particularly stood out to me enough to. Um, have you on and, and explain some of these yeah. things. So um, is, has there been an update or is there anything else you'd like to say about this one in particular uh, uh, story? So I just, I, there's not been any update yet, um, but my, one of my favorite things is just kind of the, the nerdy breakdown of how, we, how you actually get some of these stories. Um, because I think that's also, I just, I think it's worth spreading kind of some, just at least the awareness of how to catch corruption. Um, and so generally I have sourcing, which tips me off where it looked like we discussed, but a lot of it comes down to, okay, I know the president's brother's involved. How the hell do I prove he's involved, right? Um, how do I get a document that I can publish in a way that will make me feel comfortable? Um, and one of the key pieces of evidence that I haven't really discussed yet um, that, that got us from that point of knowing there was a story to being able to publish it, being able to really sell the story is that, so, it, so first off, it's really hard to get corporate records in Afghanistan. Um, it's more of an art than a science, um, but they have a corporate registry. And whenever you're looking for company ownership, wherever in the world you are, you want to find kind of the corporate registry and see if it has owners on it. And so Afghanistan's is some, some of the companies are registered under the owner's name <laughs> rather than under the company name, which means you have to know who owns it to um to find the company before you can find out who owns it in the first place. So it's a pain in the butt. But I managed to find a registration for this company under the name of a SOS International employee. And on that registration, it had a phone number and an Afghan phone number. And what were you using so to search through these records? Yeah. So what, I, again, what, what, I didn't, I, I didn't ahead, there was sorry. no evidence that we had in paper at that point yet that the, um, the president's brother owned it still. But it had an Afghan phone number. I put that number into Skype and it gave me back a person's name. And I got his, a photo of him through WhatsApp. Um, and with his name and his photo, find him on Facebook. 
And at that point, I located that I realized he was a kind of a family member of the president's um, through a couple little, uh, he was the nephew of alleged relative of the president's brother's wife. <laughs> um, so a little bit of a chain there. But more importantly, once we had that, we realized that same phone number was used to register another company that was publicly associated with the president's brother. So again, he could take his name off of it, but they forgot to um, remove the phone number that was connected with his business setup apparatus. And that, that was a key piece to say, look, again, he used to own this company. We've got a 2014 document showing his 20% share. And then a 2020 document showing this phone number that matches up with his other company right now, um, showing that there's still a connection remaining between the president's brother and this military contractor. Um, and it, it was just basically the thing was paying attention to metadata. What, what is so like what different accounts are associated with this phone number and being able to track those down, uh, which is a really valuable little trick. Yeah, that's that's certainly valuable for uh, other journalists and researchers out there. Very uh, a good piece uh, of uh, of advice in terms of um, open source intelligence gathering. So yep. yeah, um, but yeah, that's it's a it's a great story. Is there? Uh, do you want to leave us on anything? I mean, do you think you've? Uh, I don't think um, there's anything else we got actually. I, I really really like to talk to you again in case there is an update. I would like to find out more about what's happening yeah. um, with this. I, I know that there are probably going to be some interesting implications now that um, the United States has uh, announced that, uh, um, that they are pulling out of the uh, that it's pulling out of of, yeah. of Afghanistan. Um, so we will see what happens there. But again, hey, thank you yeah. um, for coming on today. I appreciate it. And sorry yeah. for the AV problems on my oh, end. No, thank you. Uh, I'm still amateur, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. And um, yeah. I'm certainly happy to keep in touch. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I like to get uh, updates. So yeah, thanks again. Yeah. All right, we'll do. All right, thank, thank you so much. All right. Peace.